You can now get two free audiobook downloads and a 30-day free trial at audible.pagosity.tv. Your choice from the world's largest selection of over 180,000 digital audiobooks and spoken word content for your iOS or Android device, Kindle, or MP3 player. Go to audible.pagosity.tv now. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of June 3rd, 2018. The podcast that paints its palette blue and gray. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's deflogenate the news of the bogus. And the big news this week is that GDPR has gone into effect, and we've talked about this before. This is that European right-to-be-forgotten law that in reality can make anyone a censor. Actually, there is some good stuff in here, mostly the stuff that makes it easy to delete your personal information from social media sites and other sites that have it. And we should have more control over our own information. But as usual, government made a complete pig's ear of it. We've talked before about how it even includes things like search engines and news stories. At the very least, it's going to mean a legal quagmire for such sites, as they're caught between someone's so-called right to be forgotten and the public's right to know newsworthy stories. When you consider that at least 38% of copyright removal requests to Google have been invalid, this only stands to make things worse. If nothing else, the mere cost of compliance will mean even more barriers to internet startups and other small competitors. Of course, we've all seen the emails by now as they ask us to opt in, or in some cases re-opt in, just to make sure they're on solid legal footing, and that includes websites I do business with directly. A lot of websites have decided to just block their services from Europe entirely, including the Los Angeles Times, the New York Daily News, the St. Louis Dispatch, the Chicago Tribune, and the Orlando Sentinel. And guess what? The net neutrality people are silent once again. It's just too bad there's nothing in there about not autoplaying video and audio. Now that's something every netizen can get behind. But hey, if this is such a great thing, can we apply it to government too? Can we call them up and insist they delete all the personal data they have on us? Say, if you're tired of the promos in this podcast, well, the patrons got it early and with no ads or promos. Just go to patreon.bogosity.tv and donate at any level. Do you have children or nieces or nephews? Are you homeschooling or just want to counter some of the socialist indoctrination most children get in school? If so, go to bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins, and you'll be taken to a website where you can get some great books for elementary age children. The Tuttle Twins books are books about liberty and free market economics that include children's versions of Bastiat's The Law, Leonard Reed's I, Pencil, and Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, as well as books about the Federal Reserve and how regulations protect business cronies. They'll learn about the harm caused by eminent domain, or regulations passed in the name of safety, and fundamental concepts of of liberty. And as you can see from the sample pages on the website, they're all easy to read and nicely illustrated. They're just $9.99 a piece, or get a special discount as well as free bonuses when you purchase all five. You can even buy in bulk to donate to schools and local libraries. So get the Tuttle Twins books at bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins. So we've talked before about the misinformation anti-GMO people engage in, and we've shown the evidence showing that they know it's all a load of crap. But this is interesting. Now we have confirmation of it directly from one of the main guys who started it all. Mark Linus was a Greenpeace activist who was the one largely responsible for a lot of the anti-GMO talking points and pretty much the movement itself, including the vilification of Monsanto. Linus, despite not having any scientific education, decided to second-guess the words of biologists and geneticists since they're all obviously evil because they work for corporations. His press releases got published all over the world and started a global hysteria. Now he's saying it was all a load of bull. At a speech in Oxford, he apologized for destroying the image of GMO developers and said, quote, I am also sorry that I helped to start the anti-GM movement back in the mid-1990s. As an environmentalist and someone who believes that everyone in this world has a right to healthy and nutritious diet of their choosing, I could not have chosen a more counterproductive path. I now regret it completely. 
His new book, Seeds of Science, doesn't have any amazing new facts, arguments, or insights to people who are already well-versed on the subject, but the fact that it's written by Linus himself is powerful. He repeatedly makes the point, with lots of examples, that if anything, the techniques of genetic modification are much safer than the kinds of modifications humans have been making to crops for thousands of years. Of course, I don't really expect it to change the minds of die-hard woos. After all, Monsanto must have got to him. But it should at least convince the fence-setters and stop things from getting worse. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government censors. It's essential in this day and age, so go to vpn.bogosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world, and they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home, and don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. So a district court ruling has just ruled Get this, that Trump cannot block people on Twitter. Now understand, we're not talking about at POTUS, the official president's Twitter account. We're talking about at real Donald Trump, his personal Twitter account. Judge Naomi Reese Buckwald said the president's Twitter account is a public forum and that blocking people is a violation of their First Amendment rights. Also, Trump doesn't have any First Amendment rights here. Because potato. Not that I would ever accuse a judge of being biased, I totally would, but it's probably worth keeping in mind that Judge Buckwald is a Clinton appointee. This is a 75-page document that just repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. It really looks like Judge Buckwald is really full of herself, which sadly, as we've seen, isn't unusual for judges. Judge Buckwald found, quote, that such space is a designated public forum and that the blocking of the plaintiffs based on their political speech constitutes viewpoint discrimination that violates the First Amendment. So according to Judge Buckwald, Twitter is a public forum. And according to the wording of this judgment, this would presumably apply to all social media sites and all accounts used by any government officials, including state and local governments, and even their employees on their personal social media accounts. Quote, In this case, the record establishes a number of limitations on the individual plaintiff's use of Twitter as a result of having been blocked. As long as they remain blocked, the individual plaintiffs cannot view the president's tweets, directly reply to these tweets, or use the at real Donald Trump webpage to view the common threats associated with the president's tweets while they are logged into their verified accounts. While alternative means of viewing the president's tweets exist, and the individual plaintiffs have the ability to view and reply to replies to at real Donald Trump tweets, they cannot see the original at real Donald Trump tweets themselves when signed into their blocked accounts. So she admits that it doesn't actually stop them from seeing the tweets or the common threads, but it still inhibits their rights somehow. She also claims that, quote, the individual plaintiffs were indisputably blocked as a result of viewpoint discrimination and that the tweets, quote, criticized the president or his policies. Of course, if you actually read the tweets in question, you see they were personal insults and flames, not policy discussion. Look, I have freedom of speech to say whatever I want to about the president, but that does not mean he has to allow me to stand outside the window of the Oval Office and shout it through a bullhorn. Or, since again we're talking about his personal account here, a better analogy might be Trump Tower. Here's a thorny issue. Can Twitter ban an account that follows the president? Or might in the future? Twitter has just been declared a public forum protected by the First Amendment, so... Could they ban an account that follows the president? Or would that be taking away someone's right to speak out to a public official in a public forum? 
And could Trump report an account to Twitter thinking the account should be banned? I mean, she ruled directly, quote, That interactive space is susceptible to analysis under the Supreme Court's forum doctrines and is properly characterized as a designated public forum. The viewpoint-based exclusion of the individual plaintiffs from that designated public forum is prescribed by the First Amendment and cannot be justified by the President's personal First Amendment interests. So then what about all of the people like Milo Yiannopoulos who have been banned from Twitter solely for expressing their political views? Does Twitter have to allow all of them back on since it's now a designated public forum? This has not been thought through. But as usual, when Trump is the target, all discussions of the unintended legal ramifications are completely absent from the news media. It was against someone they hate, so that's all they need to know. We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. And now it's time to permanently archive this week's Biggest Bogan Emitter. And this week it goes to BBC science journalist Aaron Biba, who wrote an article criticizing Elon Musk and got flamed for it BECAUSE SHE'S A WOMAN! Actually, it's because she posted several tweets attacking him personally and then deleted them to make it appear she's a victim. Of course, the rest of the media passed her narrative along unquestioningly, like Noah Schachtman of Wired and the Daily Beast, who said, quote, Erin Biba has done something incredibly brave. She's documented what happens when female journalists dare to question Elon Musk. So Musk replied to him, quote, You've done something incredibly dishonest by supporting a journo who falsely stated that I'm against science, then cherry-picked tweets that don't represent the vast majority of my followers to make false claims against them, too. Then Biba whined, quote, I gave him the benefit of the doubt in my story, just reading the comments below at Noah Schachtman's post, the post by at the Daily Beast, and my ads right now is enough to confirm that I haven't cherry-picked. Sad to say, I was wrong to think he might care. So then, of course, Twitter users pointed to her hateful tweets attacking Musk and suggested that maybe, just maybe, that's what he was referring to. She responded by deleting those tweets. You know, because she's so brave. Fortunately, we don't have right to be forgotten in this country, and as one Twitter user said, good thing the internet is forever. And we have the screenshots of what she wrote, which included, quote, It was just the manifestation of Musk's ego in the form of a space car. It was such a boring choice. If he couldn't be out there, then he picked the thing closest to himself, referring to him launching the Tesla into space earlier this year as a weight test. She also tweeted, quote, Elon just sent his giant dick into space and swung it around. And, quote, you sent a thing into space. It cost a bazillion dollars. You sent an advertisement. You are gross. And, quote, you're pretty much the worst. So what was Beba's response to the user that posted these screenshots of her tweets? She blocked him. So, so brave. Hey, wait. Does that court case we mentioned earlier apply to members of the press, too? I mean, she does work for the BBC, which is a government-owned company. 
Here's an interesting thing. Her Twitter bio actually says former fact checker. Ain't that the truth? This is creating the story, not reporting it. And of course, it's a story where she's an oh-so-brave victim of a cruel, misogynistic, patriarchy, whatever. Not at all because he was responding to incredibly mean personal attacks she levied at him. So all of that makes Aaron Biba this week's Biggest Bogan Emitter. Special treat this week, our third Silver Gluon Award winner for 2018, and this week we give it to Colian Noir, who makes pro-Second Amendment videos under the auspices of the NRA. We give the Silver Gluon Award out to people who clearly and demonstrate something to be woo, and man did Noir do that with the news media. So he made this video called How to Stop the Media from Inspiring Killers, and in it, he points out that a lot of mass shooters are inspired by the news stories about it and see it as a grab for glory and immortality, and says, And no entity on the planet does a better job, whether directly or indirectly, of glorifying these killers, and thereby providing the inspiration for the next one, than our mainstream media. So what's his solution? It's time to put an end to this glorification of carnage in pursuit of ratings, because it is killing our kids. It's time for Congress to step up and pass legislation putting common sense limitation on our mainstream media's ability to report on these school shootings. There's no need to cover these shootings for two weeks straight, plastering the kid's face over and over and over again. Pass a law stopping the media from reporting the killer's name or showing his face. You could still report on the shootings, we just need reasonable laws that place limitation on the glory and fame you give to these killers and their twisted motivations. Okay, so it's completely obvious to someone with more than two brain cells to knock together what he's doing. He's taking the media's call for common sense Second Amendment violations and applying their arguments to common sense First Amendment violations. That's the first two minutes and 45 seconds into the video, and immediately after that, he explains it. You know that feeling of anxiety that shot through your body when I said the government should pass laws to limit the media's ability to exercise their First Amendment right? That's the same feeling gun owners get when they hear people say the same thing about the Second Amendment. Hearing me advocate for the government's ability to limit anyone's First Amendment rights, including the media, should anger all of you watching this video. The same way it should anger you when anyone tries to use the same limitations on the Second Amendment and he even makes it explicit. I vehemently disagree with the government infringing on the media's First Amendment rights the same way I don't believe the government should infringe on anyone's Second Amendment rights. The solution to the problem we all want to solve will only come with a firm commitment to all of our rights, not just the ones you think are important. So how did the media respond? They only listened to that first part and then pitched a snit that. Investigative journalist Lindsay Beierstein tweeted, the NRA wants to censor coverage of school shootings. Hey, remember when investigative journalists actually did investigative journalism? Or Greg Keane, quote, That feel when America's self-styled oldest civil rights organization says F the Second Amendment and your school-age kids. It's freeing to hear these jackals do a boot-stomping dance all over the First Amendment, though. It makes clear what's been under our noses all along. The NRA was never about safeguarding constitutional freedoms or some such falderall. That was a charade. So if the NRA cedes the constitutional high ground, if it doesn't give and never has given a whit about the Bill of Rights, just its pleasure in firing hot lead, well, good. Adam Weinstein I have watched this cynical, besuited propaganda mill degenerate further into fear-mongering stupidity all my life, but openly rooting to rip up the First Amendment to deflect criticism of firearms violence is crossing a huge fucking Rubicon, even for these smug profiteers. Chris Harris, the NRA is calling for laws regulating how the media covers mass shootings. So as Noir pointed out in a follow-up video later that day, the media really showed themselves for what they are. What ended up happening as a result of that video being released is our media doing exactly what I said they've been doing for the last couple of years now. They jumped on it and began critiquing it because agenda. And what they did was take the first part of the video and reported only on the first part of the video, which demonstrated clearly that they didn't watch the video in full. Think about that for a second. This is the same media 
that is responsible for disseminating information to us. This is the same type of information that we base our opinions on, that we make decisions on, very important decisions. And they can't be bothered to watch a four minute video before writing an entire article about it. You don't even have to take four minutes to watch it. Set the speed to 1.5 and watch it in under three. So I have all these links in the show notes, and there's one from Vice, and there's another one from Bustle, and it's telling because Bustle clearly just grabbed stuff from the Vice story without even checking it. They just passed it along uncritically. And how many of these arguments could easily be turned around? Oh, the NRA is being hypocritical because they adore the Second Amendment but don't care about the First. Oh, just like you love the First Amendment but don't care about the Second? I think you've destroyed your own position there. But as intelligent people know, the Constitution is not multiple choice. Although, with everything from hate speech laws to campus censorship to net neutrality, it seems they don't actually love the First Amendment all that much. Well, I'll let Noir get the last word here. It is truly and honestly terrifying. Because if we can't depend on our major medias to give us the information that we need to make the decisions that we need to make throughout life, who can we depend on? Right on, Noir. Enjoy your shiny new silver clue on. And hey, maybe there's an AR-15 attachment for it. If you're going to shop online, use our special links to shop at Amazon. Clear your cookies and go to amazon.pagosity.tv and you won't pay a penny more for your purchase. If you haven't used the mobile app in the last 12 months, or even at all, go to get5.pagosity.tv on your phone or tablet and get $5 off your order of $10 or more. Go to prime.pagosity.tv for a free 30-day trial of Amazon Prime and enjoy thousands of movies and TV episodes, borrow Kindle books, and get unlimited two-day shipping for free. And speaking of Kindle, go to kindle.pagosity.tv for a 30-day free trial to Kindle Unlimited, read over one million books, and listen to thousands of audiobooks on any device. You can go to music.pagosity.tv and get a free 30-day trial of Amazon Music Unlimited with access to Amazon's entire library of 10 million songs, ad-free and with unlimited skips, and even download to listen offline. All great ways to help this podcast simply by shopping at Amazon. And now let's proofread this week's Idiot Extraordinary. And this week he goes to English teacher and grammar Nazi Yvonne Mason, who claims that Donald Trump grammar is so terrible that she had to correct it and send it back, and look at how stupid Trump is. Her first bit of idiocy was in thinking that Trump wrote this personally when it's a form letter that would have been written by a staffer. That alone would have qualified her for idiot extraordinaire, but in fact, everything she corrected wasn't even bad grammar to begin with. And the New York Times, CNN, and the rest of the news media reported on this completely credulously, apparently without even thinking to check the grammar themselves. In fact, very few are corrections of actual grammar. Most are about capitalization. This is about style, not grammar. And most grammarians like Mason either go with the Chicago Manual of Style or the AP Stylebook, and they'll tell you that these are the style manuals used in the real world. They are wrong. Although you'd probably be okay with using either of these in most professional contexts, a lot of professions have their own styles, like if you submit a scientific paper to a journal, that journal might have a particular manual of style you need to follow. I know from screenwriting that there's a particular style with screenplays. And if a producer glances at your script and it's not in the proper style or format, he'll just chuck it in the bin without even reading it. So Chicago and AP are not the be-all and end-all of style manuals. And guess what? The government printing office has its own style manual. The AP style book was first published in 1953. The Chicago manual was first published in 1906, but the GPOs dates back to 1894. It predates the other style manuals, and it's the style manual that was used by the Obama administration and every other administration going back to then. She could have made the same marks on any of them. So, for example, she wrote, OMG, this is wrong, with no comma after the OMG, when nation is capitalized. But according to the GPO manual, nation should be capitalized when the nation being referred to is the United States. Same with the word federal, among several others, and with the word president when referring to POTUS. 
And can you imagine what she would do with the Constitution? That capitalizes all sorts of crazy words. She was also being really dumb when the letter said, I also directed the Department of Justice to issue a rule banning devices such as bump stocks, and she circled the word rule and wrote a question mark and said, EXPLAIN RULE! Really, Mason? You don't know that the directives the DOJ passes are called rules? This is basic civics! People who watch my quickies will recognize the rant I'm about to make. The whole point of grammar is to be easily understood. Was there any part of this letter that wasn't easily understood? Who cares if nation is supposed to be capitalized or not? Can you understand what's being said? That is the point of grammar, not to be a virtue signaling pedant making sure it conforms with some bogus rule that has nothing to do with clarity of expression. It's just another example of the bourgeois narcissism that has infected academia today. I'll give you one of my favorite examples. I ain't got no pencil. Now, what did I just say? Do I have a pencil or not? Well, you know I'm saying I don't have a pencil, yet supercilious doctrinaires like Mason would scream, That's a double negative! That means you really do have a pencil! Now, I ask you, would any native English speaker interpret the sentence that way? No, of course not. We know the second negative is an emphasizer. You're not just saying you don't have a pencil, you're implying the need for one at the time. The term is called negative concord, and it's common in many languages including Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Polish, Hebrew, and many others. In fact, most languages are negative concord. Oh, but Latin isn't, and so just like the bogus rules that we can't split an infinitive or end a sentence with a preposition, if it's the way Latin is, it must be the way English is. And yet you have people like Shakespeare and Milton using double negatives, and Chaucer, who has double, triple, or even quadruple negatives in the Canterbury Tales. The only reason these rules are there is so that the grammarian can feel superior to the plebes which is exactly what Mason is doing. In fact, she's worse than that. She's not just a pedant. She's not just a grammar Nazi. She's outright wrong. None of her corrections marked anything that was incorrect. Mason is trying to feel oh so superior to Trump. Well, Mason, you aren't. You're merely this week's... Idiot, Idiot. Extraordinary. Well, that wraps up this Everybody Wanted to Get in the Newspaper Story About It edition of the Bogosity Podcast. Come join the discussion at forum.bogosity.tv or discord.bogosity.tv and feel free to send a question, statement, news article, or rant in text or audio to podcast at bogosity.tv. This podcast depends on you to keep going, so please donate using the links on the website or the QR codes in the thumbnail or support Shane DK on Patreon or Maker Support to get the podcast and YouTube videos early and without ads or promos. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Charles Yang. When it comes to the proper use of language, universal grammar is the ultimate authority. It is not about what rules are deemed reasonable or popular. It is about what rules are true. And one sign for a true rule is that it appears in young children long before they are polluted by dubious grammatical advice. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial and Derivatives 4.0 International License. Gossip. Want answers to creationist claims against evolution? Would you like to know more about evolution yourself, or even engage creationists more directly, with actual peer-reviewed sources to back you up? My book, How Evolution is Scientific, is designed to show the basics of evolutionary theory and how it is so well supported using the scientific method. It's impeccably sourced, with references to the actual scientific material, and is arranged using the creationists' own criteria of what is scientific. Using their own arguments against them, see how evolution is scientific, but creationism is not. Based on observations, accurate predictions, logic, and evidence. Get answers to common creationist claims, and even a primer on abiogenesis, the start of all life. 
It's all in my book, How Evolution is Scientific, available at Amazon and on Kindle, EPUB, and PDF as well. Get How Evolution is Scientific and never be taken in by creationists again.